Join us for a highly anticipated new series, Heroines of Islam hosted by Layla Nashiba. Allow her to take you through time exploring the lives of these powerful courageous, spiritual pillars of Islam. Learning about their lives through a lens, unique and explained through a woman's point of view using authentic hadith. Tune in every Monday and Wednesday 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. Right here on Sunnah Followers. He was said to be devout in her religious duties. An excellent orator, writer, warrior. The daughter of Umar bin Khattab a trusted and loved companion of the Prophet peace and blessings be upon him. Her name is Hafsa bint Umar. Tune in every Monday and Wednesday 9 p.m. Eastern as you host Layla Nashiba once again dives into into the lives of these prolific women in Islam. Catch it right here on Sunnah Followers. Welcome to our series entitled Heroines of Islam, the Heroines of Islam. And this is one of my favorite uh, uh, topics to teach. Uh, as you guys know, it takes a lot out of me to teach it because I have to really, being a fantastical person, I have to really put myself into the character. I have to put myself into these uh, female companions and, uh, and try to think like they were thinking to break things down to you. So it's kind of, you know, texting for me to do, to do that, texting for me to do that. But mashallah, I enjoy it because it helps to build my iman. It helps to reaffirm uh, my purpose in life. And uh, learning about these female companions reminds me that uh, my struggles in life, my challenges in life personally as a female uh, is nothing compared to theirs, to what theirs were. You know, they're the mothers of the believers. They are the best women ever created, you know, and if they could endure their trials and their challenges, who am I to complain about mine? So I enjoy teaching it for that reason. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that we do have a lot of brothers who attend these sessions because a lot of you brothers have daughters. You know, that's one of the signs of the last hour that the women will outnumber the men. So a lot of people are giving birth to daughters and it's important that your daughters learn to be strong like these women were. You know, it's important that your daughters uh, understand that they were created uh, with the same purpose that men were created, and that is to worship Allah, to worship Allah and to prove every day of their life that he comes first, you know, so that's the purpose. And so I'm glad that you brothers are attending and that you have your daughters listening and your wives. You know, I got my polygamy sisters here from the polygamy room I'm in. Wait, let me make sure. Hold on. Oh, I forgot about you. Hold on, sisters. How do I go to this? Let me go to the chat. Okay, when I type this, this will let me know if I'm connected to everybody. Testing Loxie. Y'all know that's my nickname. Y'all see Loxie? That's Layla. That's my nickname. Yeah, they call me Loxie. <laughs> Don't ask me why. <laughs> that's the nickname at my job. My coworkers gave me, my clients, Locks, Loxy. So I guess they couldn't say Layla, Loxy, Locks. Well, there I am. Okay, good. Okay, I see you. Okay, there's the new Muslims group, polygamy group, mashallah. Oh, I got a couple of imams here too. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, look at this. Who we have here with us? Masha Allah. We got the Imam from Compton. He's in the house. Sabrine. Compton's in the house. <laughs> we also got Imam from Fresno, California. That's not our Fresno, but that's the other mosque. And we got the brother. Oh, Masha Allah. Abdul Malik. How are you? Oh, it's been a long time. Masha Allah. From out of Chicago. Masha Allah. Abdul Malik, welcome. You guys are listening to my series, huh? 
Oh, okay. You guys are streaming me. Oh, one of them Imam said he's streaming me to the sisters and the girls in his community. MashaAllah. May Allah bless you all. Give my salams to your wife and everything. Tell her, you know, I got what she sent me in the mail. May Allah bless her. Alhamdulillah. And give my salams to your daughters too. I get their emails too. MashaAllah. So we got the Imams in here with us too. Alhamdulillah. All right, let's get started. Now, when I covered the series, the story of Khadijah, Ready Allahu Anha, remember her story was a story of strength. Her story was a story of struggle. Her story was a story of deep embedded faith and belief in Allah. She was the most perfect woman ever created besides Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was second to Mary. She was so great, a wife so great, a mother so great, a woman that the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, remember we talked about it, didn't need nobody else. The Quraysh used to tease him. And they used to try to tell him because even before Islam, the men had more than one wives. They had 50, some of them, 20. They had harems. Where you think harems came from? And they used to tell him, oh, Muhammad, none of your sons live. Why don't you marry a young girl? Why don't you marry somebody else besides Khadijah? And that's because they were jealous. Because even though Khadijah was an older woman, she was beautiful. She was a woman of dignity a woman of finesse, class, wealth. She turned down all their offers of marriage and the prophet knew that. He said, no, I'm happy with what I got. I got the best. And that would just make them angry. So her story was a story of strength, reserve and deep inbounded faith. And then after she died, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's when he took on other wives. And each of the other wives was like a component of, of, of Khadijah, ready Allahu Anna. Sada, when we did Sada's story, she was the second wife who he married after the, uh, after, uh, the first wife he married after Khadijah, ready Allahu Anna. When he married Sada, we did Sada's story. Sada's story was a story of sacrifice. We learned sacrifice. How when we sacrifice for the sake of Allah, everything just falls into place because her whole struggle, her whole story was about sacrifice. And then he married Aisha, ready Allahu on her. And their relationship, their marriage was a, a, a proof of push and pull, how we have to work hard and fight for what we love, for what we want. You know, their whole relationship was push and pull, whereas his relationship with Khadijah, ready Allahu on her, was effortless. That's the perfect relationship. We all look for that. We look for a relationship of effortless. It just falls into place. Everything just makes sense. I blend with you, you blend with me. We're two halves of a whole. It's just effortless. We don't have to try to make it work. It just falls into place. Sada was sacrificed. Khadijah, effortless. Aisha, ready Allahu anha, was push and pull. Well, now we're going to go to the next wife he married. And this is Hafsa, ready Allahu anha, the daughter of Umar. And you're going to discover that their relationship was different. This is a relationship in which we learn that when it comes to marriage, we often have to learn how to exercise self-control. Aisha, push and pull. Her and the prophet, push and pull, push and pull, give and take, give and take. Hafsa, self-control. So let's start uh, her, the, her series today. Let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen and you guys will see what I mean when I say self-control. 
knowing when to hold and when to fold. This is something that all of us as Muslims need to learn. Learn when to hold and learn when to fold. You got to know when to hold them. Here we go. Know when to fold them. I'm sorry, guys. That's what the 80s, I tell you guys, that's the damage that music does to you. I listened to music all the time when I was in, the, in, in college and in my 20s, the 80s. You got to know when to hold them. Hello. When to fold them. Hit it, brothers. <laughs> Those songs just come in my head. I don't know. They just come out of nowhere. But anyway, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about with her story. Let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen. <laughs> One of the imams say, that's true. You do got to know when to hold and when to fold. Yeah. I forgot who sung it. One of them cowboy dudes. <laughs> I don't know. That, that, those songs, that's the that's the danger of music. They, it never leaves you. The shaitan, yeah. Okay, well, anyway, <laughs> here's part one. Today, we're going to uh, 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 start off with the beginning, the early life of Hafsa, the daughter of Umar, and her marriage to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you will see that this is a relationship of self-control and the reason why i use this video because hafsa ready allahu on her she was also a warrior remember i tell you guys in the dark ages the arabic people they were a nomadic warrior race of people just like the vikings just like the persians they were a warrior race of, of people you had to know how to wield wield a sword wield a bow, wield a, a, a pole with the Arabs, as um, the Arab women used to say, we are the women of the tents. Give us a pole and we can wield it right through your juggler vein. Okay, so Hafsa was a true warrior. And how could she not be? Because she was the daughter of a warrior. She was the sister of warriors. You know, and we talked about how the Arabs trained their women. They trained their women in warfare too. Remember Aisha, ready Allahu Anha, she served as a nurse and also intelligence. Whenever the Muslims fought against their enemies, Aisha would not only help with the sick, but she was would also gather intelligence as to what was going on with the enemy and take it back to the prophet. They trained their women in warfare, okay? Sauda, we talked about how Aisha, ready Allahu Anha said that there was no more better fighter amongst the wise of the prophet than Sauda. Even though she was an older woman, Sauda was very strong. Sauda was very resolute. She would be on that battlefield too. And we already know that Khadijah, ready Allahu Anha, she used her, 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 her affluence. What would she say? Leave him alone, Abu Jahal. I am the daughter of Kuwait. Let him go. She knew how to use her power, use her status, who she was the daughter of, to command the people. Okay, well, Hafsa, she was a fighter. She was a true ninja warrior. They got her in trouble too, as you're gonna find out. Let's start it off. Okay, for my new Shahadas who are here, mashallah, just so to let you guys know, just like Aisha, ready Allahu Anha, was the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad's best friend, Abu Bakr. Hafsa was the daughter of his second best friend, Umar, ready Allahu Anha, okay? And just like Aisha was related to the Prophet because they were all from the, uh, the Quraysh tribe, so was Hafsa, okay? She was from the Adi branch of the Qurayshi tribe, okay? Umar was a cousin to the Prophet Sallallahu
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, just as Abu Bakr was, just as Umar was, just as Ali was, just as Um Habiba was, just as Zainab was. They were all related. Most of the wives, as you will see, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married were from the Quraysh. They were related to him. They were cousins, distant, or, well, Zainab was close. She was his first cousin. Okay. So Hafsa was also related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And being so, just like Aisha, ready Allahu Anha, she was beautiful. The Qurayshi women were beautiful. Zainab was the most beautiful of them all. How could she not be? She was his first cousin. Okay. Hafsa was a distant cousin, but she was very attractive too. All of the prophet's wives were beautiful, every single one, okay? Also, the lineage. Remember, we talked about how the Arabs were big on their lineage, and they still are. I know I am. Y'all know me. What does Layla do? I'm always doing DNA testing. Y'all know I'm 30% Bantu. I got 30% African blood from all over Africa. Then I got that... Uh, that Arabic, what, 35% uh, uh, Viking and the other 30, 40 something, whatever it is, that's Arabic. Okay, we always into lineage, tracing our roots. Well, the lineage of Umar, ready Allah, who on her merges with the lineage of the Prophet Muhammad a few generations before. Okay. And Hafsa's mother was a woman named Zainab bint Mazun el Jumehia. She was the sister of Uthman ibn Mazun. We talked about him yesterday. The hadith that we went over in our class on termites yesterday, that was his sister, okay? And Hafsa, according to her father, was born in the year 605 AD of course, in Mecca. And guess what, guys? She was born five years before the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, received the call to prophethood. So she was young, much, much young. She wasn't as young as Aisha, but she was a teen, okay? Hafsa also became Muslim during the Meccan period, and she was with the Muslims and made Hijra to Medina. But when she made Hijra, what made her different than Aisha, ready Allah who on her, is that uh, uh, Hafsa was married. Her first husband was a man named Hunais ibn Huzafa. Now remember, guys, the hadith where the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was approached by Jibreel alayhi slam after the battle of Badr. No, after the battle of Uhud. And Jibril said, oh Muhammad, what would you say about the men who fought and died the battle of Badr? Your fallen brothers. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said they were the best of all the Muslims. Those men who fought and died the battle of Badr were the best, the strongest in faith, the best of the Muslims. And that's when Jibril said, just as you had the best of the Muslims with you on that battlefield, the best of the angels are with me. It was me, Michael, Israfil, all the Allah sent the best of the angels. So as you can see from that hadith, that the man who was the first husband of Hafsa, ready Allahu Anha, he was one of the best of the Muslims. He migrated from Mecca to Medina and he died on the battlefield. So did Abu Salama. We're going to do the story of Um Salama too. Her husband, Abu Salama, was one of the best of the Muslims too. He died the battle of Badr too. Okay. So Hafsa. She married young like all the women did back in the 8th century, not just Arabic women, Viking women, European women. They were given away in marriage at birth. I told you that. If a woman had a child, it would automatically be married to somebody. 
And then when the children reach puberty, they decide if they're going to go through with the marriage. But in European history, it's a little different. They forced the women to marry these old kings. The kings, Henry and them would marry, the kings would marry little six-year-old girls who were not even puberty. The Arabs would not allow the women to move in with the men as husband and wife until the girls were puberty. A little bit more class than the Europeans had, okay? History, do your history check. I'm a historian. All right, so anyway, so Hafsa, ready Allahu anha, she had been married when she was a teenager uh, to this wonderful man who died and fought and died during the Battle of Badr. After he was killed, uh, uh, um, uh, his funeral was led by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet led his funeral. And when uh, her husband was killed, during this battle, her father, Umar, ready Allahu anha, was so sad because at this point, uh, Hafsa was only 18 years old, guys. She was only 18 years old and she was a widow at such a young age. And every time Umar would visit his daughter, he would find her crying and weeping over her husband, who she lost and who she loved. So the Umar did the best thing that any man can do to try to help his daughter in this situation. He tried to get her remarried. And not only was he spurred to seek another husband for her uh, to relieve her distress, but also this was the custom of the Arabs during that, those days. That uh, if, uh, if your daughter or, or some a girl who was close to you, your daughter or your sister, lost their husband and became a widow, you would try to marry her as soon as possible and not just to anyone, but try to find a virtuous man to marry her to because that shows how you care for your relatives. Remember, the Arabs were big on kinship ties, okay? So with this intention, Umar first went to Uthman, ready Allahu anha as a possible uh, suitor for his wife. Because Uthman too had just lost his wife, Rukaya. Remember, he was married to the daughter of the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She had died. But when, however, when, U when Umar approached Uthman, Uthman asked for a few days to think it over. Then after a few days had went by, he told Umar, uh, that's okay, Umar, you know, thank you for asking, but I am not considering marrying anyone at this time. Umar was kind of su uh, surprised and caught off by his answer. But nonetheless, he went to see Abu Bakr because Abu Bakr was a righteous man. And he made the same proposal to him. Abu Bakr also turned him down. Now, Umar was both confused and he was hurt. In fact, it, he got angry. You know, Umar had a problem with his temper. Umar went to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to speak to him about how he offered his daughter in marriage to two righteous men, Uthman and Abu Bakr, and they turned her, her down. And Uthman, I mean, when Umar was telling the Prophet, he said, my daughter's not ugly. He said, she's my daughter. You know, she's well-raised. She's very attractive. She's not ugly. She's still young. You know, why would they turn her down? And in the response, that's when the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, oh, Umar, Allah has uh, uh, destined a more righteous husband for your daughter than Uthman. And Allah has destined a more honorable wife for, uh, for Uthman than your daughter. He said, I intend and want to marry Hafsa. And so you can imagine how happy uh, this made Umar, ready Allahu anha, because again, uh, just three years before, the prophet had married Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr. And now to marry his daughter too? 
this would make them related. They'd be in-laws and oh my God, the tie of kinship and oh, wow. So Umar was happy, happy that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose his daughter Hafsa. Okay. And this marriage took place during the month of Shaban. Again, this is the third year after the migration. Okay. And again, remember the prophet had married uh, Aisha, ready Allahu anha, uh, after, I mean, that's when she moved. Aisha, ready Allahu anha, moved into his house uh, right uh, 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 during the time of the Battle of Badr. So now you can see the Battle of Badr had ended. Um, Hafsa had, but was a widow. So you can see it wasn't that much longer after Aisha had been taken as his wife, uh, I mean, to, moved in. She had been married him before, but moved in. It wasn't that long after Aisha had moved in to, as the wife that Hafsa was married. So he married her and her wedding dowry was 400 dirhams. And after the prophet married Hafsa, Abu Bakr went to Umar to congratulate him. And he said, oh, Umar, perhaps you were angry with me when you offered your daughter to me in marriage. Umar said, yes, I was. Abu Bakr said, well, the only thing that prevented me from accepting your offer was that I knew that the prophet wanted to marry her. And I did not want to you know, convey his secret he said, but if, if the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had no desires to marry her, I would have gladly accepted her in marriage. And that made Umar feel good too, because he knew that, that nothing was wrong with his daughter. Okay. So the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married Hafsa, the daughter of Umar, and Uthman married Um Khutum, who was the daughter, other daughter of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why am I using this picture? I'm using this picture to show you that the Arabs were Bedouins. And to this day, this is a Bedouin dress the women wear. The women did do, uh, would cover their faces with this, and they still do to this day. Okay? They did not wear burqa. All right? This is a Bedouin woman of today. So thus Hafsa became one of the mothers of the believers and she too became a beloved wife of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was 22 years old. She was 22 years old when she married the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you can see how much older she was than Aisha. Aisha was 10, was nine. Aisha was nine when she moved in and assumed her wifely duties. Well, when the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married Hafsa, Hafsa was 22. And let me tell you what made Hafsa stand out over many of the other women. Hafsa was one of the few people who could read and write. Okay. She could read and she could write. She was literate. And when she married the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at that time, remember, Sada was helping teach Aisha how to be a wife because Aisha had just recently assumed her wife duties. So Aisha had her own apartment. All the wives had their own apartments attached to the mosque. Aisha had her apartment. Sada's was next to her. And guess whose apartment was next to that? Uh, 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 on the other side of Sada was Hafsa. But Hafsa spent a lot of time at Sada's house with Aisha. Remember, I told you guys, Sada, she was the one that kept the family together. Everybody loved Sada. She kept peace between the wives. She was funny. She was deaf, couldn't hear in one of her ears, and they used to tease her and play games with her, and she was, ooh, real anxious, ooh, always jumping, ooh, like this. So they had fun with Sada. So uh, uh, Hafsa spent a lot of time at, at Sada's house like Aisha did, you know, uh, learning how to be a wife and also, you know, playing games. You know, they like to do little games with Sada. 
subhanallah. And that's where all the children were too. Saul, all the children of the prophets were there at Sada's house. So Sada, ready Allahu anha, she welcomed Hafsa just as she welcomed Aisha with a happy heart. And in the beginning, guys, the first few years of the marriage of Hafsa was kind of uh, 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 different. She at first had to get used to Aisha because Aisha, as we talked about, had you know was very outspoken. Aisha could be very conceited. <laughs> she was young, okay, very mischievous. So in the beginning, Hafsa was distant. But she began to get used to Aisha and her and Aisha became the best of friends. In fact, they became so close that on some occasions, they together would conspire against the otherwise of the prophet. And we'll talk about that, okay? But just like Aisha had a special position with the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she was his best student. He taught Aisha everything. Hafsa had an important position too with him. Number one, she was uh, literate. She could write. She was one of the ones whenever the Quran, uh, the verses of the Quran were sent down, she would write them. She would write them. She had her own personal mushaf. Aisha did too. But Hafsa had her own personal one that she would write herself because she was literate. She was also very well-mannered. She had a strong uh, will and determination, but she had one big problem, her temper. She, uh, somebody deal with that. Or do I have any uh, moderators in here? Please take care of that, okay? She had a very bad temper. You know, uh, Hafsa inherited that from her father. She would get angry. Uh, Aisha had a temper too, but Hafsa's was worse than Aisha's. Okay, and because of her temper, Umar, ready Allahu on her, used to advise Hafsa, you know, to watch her temper the same way Abu Bakr did Aisha. We talked about how Abu Bakr would often come and check on Aisha and he would grab her and admonish her for her tongue for being flippant because Aisha was flippant, smart mouthed. Well, Hafsa would get angry. And sometimes if she get angry, she would get heavy handed. She would hit something. She would throw a glass, knock a glass over. She'd yell, shout, hit the table, hit something. So Umar, ready Allah who on her, there's many hadiths of him admonishing her. In fact, he would grab her and say, don't you hit, don't you yell, control your temper. Okay, we have one hadith that's in Bukhari that I really, uh, like that shows how our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was uh, when we go, we're going to talk about this incident of the secret. When um, Hafsa ready Allah who on her had uh, uh, in, uh, told a secret and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was going to divorce her. When Umar heard what she did, he came to her and grabbed her and he hit her. And then he raised his hand to hit her again and the prophet caught his hand. And he said, Umar, you may hit your wives. He said, this is my wife. I don't hit him. He said, whatever she did, it's me and her. He said, but you are not going to hit my wife. You know, so that's how Umar, he was so angry at Hafsa because Hafsa had that temper and she was spoiled too, you know, uh, by him because she was his favorite, his favorite daughter. All right. So she was very intelligent, very strong will. She was a, a good wife, but she had that one problem, a temper. And she wanted to be like Aisha, ready Allah on her. Her and Aisha were thicker than thieves. And this is something else that Umar would remind her of. He would say, you know, you, 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 you're not special to the prophet like Aisha is, just like I'm not special to him as her father is. Aisha can say things. 
and she can do things and get away with it. He said, you can't say things, the same things that she said, because the prophet doesn't have that love for you that he has for her. Even though he shows all of his wives love, everybody knows Aisha's his heart. So Umar used to tell Hafsa all the time, you got to, you got to know how to, when to hold and know when to fold. You can't be vocal like Aisha. So this was the problem with her, learning how to hold and learning when to fold. Learning her limit. And let's talk about some of these uh, incidents. Well, we got several detailed uh, hadiths regarding um, how Hafsa and her temper was. In one of these instances, Umar, ready Allahu anha, felt uncomfortable. We talked about how when Allah sent down uh, the verses telling men to be good to their wives, Remember we talked about how uh, the women began to not obey their husbands? Some of the women wouldn't even have relations with their husbands. Well, Umar felt uncomfortable about the way his personal wife, his wife was treating him after they made uh, the migration. So Umar reprimanded his wife for her behavior. And when he was yelling at his wife about her behavior, she said, huh, why don't you go tell that to Muhammad's wives? Because the Prophet Muhammad's wives, they, they talk back to him too. And Umar said, what? So he went to Hafsa, who was one of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, Hafsa, do any of you women get angry with the Prophet and yell at him and, and, and get angry with him and stay angry with him throughout the whole night? She said, yes. And when she said this, he said, well, whoever of you does that is a loser. You will never have success. He said, and I really hope you're not doing that, Hafsa. Because remember, if something makes the prophet angry, it makes a law angry too. He said, know your place, Hafsa. You are not to uh, the prophet like Aisha is to him. He said, obey your husband, never desert him from the bed because that's what the women were doing. They weren't sleeping with their husbands, you know? So he, uh, he admonished Hafsa about that. And another time he told Hafsa, oh, my daughter, if you make the prophet angry, know that Allah will give him better wives than you. So he was constantly reminding Hafsa, you know, to not fall into that game that many of the women were falling into, you know, with disrespecting their husbands and all that, because this is when Allah sent down rights for women. Before Islam, women did not have rights. Women were nothing more than animals. But after Allah sent the rights down, liberating women, raising women up to the status that we have today, which is why there's no need for feminism, because Allah gave us all our rights, you know, the women began to abuse that. Okay. So Umar, ready Allah, who on her reprimanded uh, his daughter for that. And let's talk about one incident. This is the incident involving the honey syrup. And all of these hadiths can be found in Sahih Bukhari. They can also be found in Sahih Muslim. They can also be found in Muwatta. That's my sources. And according to these sources, one of the most important events which Hafsa, ready Allahu anha, got herself involved in was the honey syrup incident. This became a conflict between the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his wives, their jealousy. And it all started because he went to visit Hafsa. She did nothing wrong. She just offered him some honey syrup. She knew that Zainab liked honey too, okay? So Hafsa had got some honey syrup and she made a drink for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because of what happened, that's when Allah sent down the first verses of Surat al tahrim And listen to what Aisha, radiallahu anha, tells us about this incident. 
She said the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very fond of honey and he liked sweets. And it was his habit, as we talked about before, it was his habit to visit his wives after the Asa prayer. After Asa prayer, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would visit with all his wives, check on them to make sure that they were okay. And then the wives would meet at the house of whoever's turn it was for that night. He, she said one time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to check on Hafsa, but he stayed longer with her than usual. And Aisha said, I became jealous and I wanted to know why he was spending all that time at Hafsa's house. You know, remember that was Aisha's problem. She was young, immature, her jealousy. And so Aisha began to ask, why is the prophet in her house all this time? Why hasn't he left there yet? And she was told that one of the women uh, from Hafsa's tribe had given her uh, some honey as a present. And, and Hafsa had made some syrup with it and made a drink for the prophet to drink. And that's what he was doing. He was over there drinking honey with her. So Aisha said, I was so jealous. I said, well, we're gonna stop him from doing this. So she went to Sada and she said, when the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to visit you tonight, you know, to check on you, tell him that his breath stinks. Because Aisha knew that the prophet hate anything that smelled bad, especially his breath. And then she also went to Sophia, Sophia, who was another one of the wives and told her too, when the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to check on you tonight, tell him that his breath smells. Because then he will say, Hafsa made me a drink. And then you tell him, well, maybe the bees of that honey suck the juice of the tree that has a bad smell. So this was concocted by Aisha, okay? And, and needless to say, guys, that's what happened. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam finally left Hafsa's home and went to check on Sada, Sada was the one that said it. She said, oh, uh, what's that bad smell? And uh, he said, Hafsa made me a, a honey drink. And, and she told him, well, maybe the bees had taken that juice from the Urfa tree. And then he went to Aisha. Aisha said the same thing, your breath smells. And then he went to Sophia. She said the same thing. And so when all three of these wives complained about the odor from his mouth, he went back to Hafsa. And Hafsa said, you want some more? She thought he wanted more of the honey drink. He said, no. He said, I don't need it. And, and in fact, he said, I'm not gonna ever drink it again. And Aisha thought it was so funny. She told Sada and Sophia, don't say nothing about it. Don't say nothing about it. So, you know, this is an example of some of the games, which shows you that the prophet's wives were no different than we are today. Women are jealous. And this is the thing that you brothers have to consider when you take on uh, two, three or four wives. You know, the women are going to get jealous. And even though you may do everything to make them all feel loved, you got to watch out for these type of games that women will play. That's why I encourage you brothers, put them in different cities. <laughs> That's what I say. For the people that want to do gammy, you better put them in different suburbs or different parts of the city or different countries. Because women can play some games, man. If you don't want that type of drama, keep them apart. <laughs> you know, the prophet's wives lived next door to each other. They were in apartments side by side by side. They would look out the window and concede. Oh, no. Separate them. And Hafsa and Aisha were close. But even though that's your friend, don't no woman like the idea that you're her husband spending more time with somebody else. See, separate them, different cities, different countries even. <laughs> All right. Um, 
So that's one incident. And then we have the big incident that happened uh, in regards to keeping the prophets secret. We have another account. This is another authentic hadith about Hafsa. The prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had conf confided in her a secret and told her not to tell it to anyone else. But she couldn't keep it. Guess who she told it to? The worst person to tell it to, Aisha. Ready, Allah, who on her. And because of this, that's when Allah sent down the third verse of Surah At-Tahrim. Okay? And there's different theories as to what this secret was. Okay? Uh, most of the people say that the secret was that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had confided to Hafsa that he made an oath that he would never eat honey again because of the way he made his breath smell. That's one theory. Okay? Then there's another theory that the secret was that um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's uh, right hand possession, Maria, that he had been together in Hafsa's home when Hafsa wasn't there with Maria. And he had told Hafsa about it and, and made her promise to not mention it because uh, that's another story. When I do the story of Maria, you guys will see, Maria was not his wife. She was his right hand possession, okay? And none of the wives wanted her to live with them. What happened in those days when the man, that when they would fight the battles, whatever prisoners of war, captives of war became the right hand possessions of the men. And they, they were like uh, slaves. And the men would take those slave women and have them live in the houses with their wives. Well, nobody wanted Maria to live with them because she was beautiful, okay? He wanted her to stay with Aisha. Aisha said, no way. He went to Um Salam, no way. He went to, How? no way. Well, it, this they say that on this incident of the secret, he was with Maria in Hafsa's home and he confided in Hafsa and told her that he was. And Hafsa was so hurt, they say, that she went and told Aisha and otherwise. That's another theory. Allah knows best. Okay. And then the third theory is that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had confided to Hafsa that after he died, Abu Bakr and Umar will become head of the state after him. And she ended up telling Aisha that. So which one it was, these are all authentic hadith saying it could have been any of them. Allah knows best. The bottom line is uh, she broke that trust. And as a result of that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam divorced her. Everybody hear that? He gave her one talik, one talik, one talik, one divorce, which means that there's a waiting period. And they say that when Umar, ready Allahu anha, heard that the prophet had divorced Hafsa, he became so angry with Hafsa. That's when he went over there to her and grabbed her and hit her. And the prophet told him, no, don't hit her again. Okay. And then they say, finally, Allah sent down a verse, which he did. Allah sent down a verse telling um, uh, um, the prophet to take Hafsa back. So the prophet took her back. He divorced her, one talik, but he took her back. But the reason they say the prophet divorced her was to teach the seriousness of keeping a secret. And that's why when we read these hadiths and those verses of the Quran talking about the importance of not breaking a secret, that's because of what happened with Hafsa. So she had to be made an example to the rest of the Ummah, you know, that we got to learn when to hold and learn when to fold, learn when to control ourselves, control ourselves, control the tongue. When somebody tells you something in confidence, you don't tell it to anyone, especially not Aisha.
the most jealous of them all because she gonna run with it because it's gonna give her an upper hand over you Subhanallah. allah you know so he divorced her but he took her back allah told him to take her back and he did okay um yeah, and all of this is me telling you guys here that, you know, we have to understand the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made an example with her that if you're married to a prophet of Allah, you know, you get, if he tell you something in confidence, you can't go in and break that confidence. You know, the Prophet had enemies amongst the Quraysh. He had enemies amongst the hypocrites. You know, if he can't come to you, his wife, and confide in you, who can he confide in? So she was made an example in that situation. And again, guys, uh, Umar, a lot of her marriage was spent with Umar reprimanding her. And this is the hadith where he told her, neither yours nor your father's position beside the prophet is like Aisha and her father's position. This hadith is in Bukhari. He said, Aisha can get away with things that you can't get away with because he has more uh, uh, attachment to her than he does to you. And again, Hafsa's temper got her in a lot of trouble, but that's the only time that the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam can be proven here to have divorced her and take her back. Now the Shiites, they got their lies. The Shiites say that he divorced her and never took her back. But who cares what the Shiites say? They hate Umar. They hate Aisha. They hate everybody anyway. But the bottom line is he gave her one pronouncement of divorce and he took her back. Okay, so I'm going to stop right here for today. When we meet for this class again on Monday, I'm going to wrap up her story. We're going to talk about what happened, you know, uh, how she was able to change she did learn control. Aisha was the culprit of a lot of her problems. Okay, but she eventually learned to control her temper a little bit better. And so we'll talk about that the next time we meet. And I'm going to also go over her death and stuff the next time we meet too. Okay, but what I want you guys to walk away from this understanding is never, ever, ever think that because of who your father is or because of who your mother is, that that should play a great uh, role and have a great effect in your relationship with someone else. Because Hafsa's marriage was nothing more than control. She had to learn when to stop, learn when to stop, learn when to back off with her temper learn when to back off in her mischievousness with Aisha. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop right here. Supana kalahuma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilaika.